Hey everybody, welcome back to our neck of the woods. Today's video, we are finally going to get the HRV up and running. So I'm going to show you about how our Life Breath uh, 267 works, the settings that you have to do basically for summer, winter, fall, spring. Uh, if you end up cooking something really heavy or if there's a lot of people in the house, basically what's kind of the preferred settings to uh, use all of this to basically bring that down. So uh, stick around, I'm gonna show you what we got going on, finish the install, drilling the hole through the concrete, and basically what the overall game plan is. All right, so I already had all of this on video and the footage basically disappeared. No clue where it went. Uh, basically, I already talked about how we're gonna get, get this thing up and running. And then if you guys remember from the past video, the intake and exhaust that we have into the house, I basically had three of each. So you wanna put the exhaust or the returns to suck everything out of the house and push it outside you want it in basically kind of areas that you're not gonna be in a lot. So that would be for our house, we put one down inside of the gym, and if we leave the gym door open to the uh, utility room, that would be an exhaust, or that would be a return. We would suck the air out of the gym, suck it out of the utility room, and we would blow it outside. You would also put it in laundry rooms, closets, and basically all of your bathrooms. So we had one over in the utility gym area, we had one in the master bath, and we had one in the bath downstairs, and that was it. As for the intakes, you want it places that you're gonna basically be living. So we put one in the master bedroom, one down inside of the vault bedroom, and one down right below our feet in the main living area in the basement. Well, I thought I needed two more or one of each, and it was also recommended to put one in the kitchen area, so I went ahead and installed one in the kitchen, and then I installed another one over here in the living room for the first floor. And basically that was all I had on, uh, on footage there. Uh, to protect these things while we're under construction, I went ahead and put some screen over it and just siliconed it to the floor. So that way no large pieces of dust or anything can get in there. Hopefully the screen will catch it and uh, we'll just be able to vacuum that up. And then of course, once the house is gonna be up and running, then we go ahead and put our floors in. We'll just cut those screens out and uh, no harm, no foul. Now, if you guys remember on the first video, the reason why we do not have any of the duct work on kind of the front side of the house, why I actually do not have a return in the closet or in the master or uh, uh, the utility room over here for the washer dryer, is because that main beam that's going down the center of the house, I cannot drill a six inch hole through that main beam. So unfortunately, everything has to stay on that side of the house. But as you just saw with at least with the kitchen and the one here in the living room, they're basically centered. So we should be able to get fresh air over here just as easily on the back side of the house. And again, for the bedrooms, they can basically just fill up the bedroom. And uh, for this return over here, the, uh, the closet door can stay open, and then the master bedroom to the shower or the bathroom can stay closed. So you'll exhaust all of the air out of the shower and the closet at the same time, and they can basically breathe the same uh, air. Now, I did not get on file or I did not get on video when I was installing this ductwork right here up in front of the fireplace. This is where I fell off of my ladder and I broke my arm. It was not on camera, and even if it was, I probably wouldn't have shown you guys fall or f show you guys me falling because I really don't think I can do that to my mother or anybody else. Uh, wasn't that bad. I just sat there for a second and then got up and was trying to like loosen it up. But uh, yeah, it, it is not on uh, file so uh, you're not gonna see it anyway. But the only thing that I have to do down here, I have to run this wire or this hose right here just to complete it over to here. And this will finalize all of the duck runs and everything will be connected. And then I've got to take this T right here and I've got to connect it to that new one that we put over here uh, up for the kitchen area. And that would be this guy right here. So I just need to put a T in this return line 
connect it over to right there that's going right up in there and then all of the ductwork will be 100% done and then that leaves us with two things in here I've got to get the condensation lines done and put it over here into this little giant so all the condensation will go into that condensation pump and then it will all get sucked over to the sump pump on the other side of the basement and then we have to finally drill through here through the concrete and get the intake and exhaust uh, done and finalized over there. But we got to wait for daylight and again for the rental places to open up and then we'll go ahead and get started on those two holes over there, finish out the duct work, and then for the first time we will be able to fire this guy up. All right, everybody, it is core drilling time, but first we need to get some measurements so that we actually don't make a mistake because I do want to drill from the outside so we're not creating like a dust cloud on the inside. So luckily, we've got the gas line coming under here. So I've got to measure basically the gas line over to the side of the genstone, and then we can measure from the genstone over, and that way we'll know where the gas line is on top of the deck here. All right, 54 and three quarter. All right, 54 and three quarter, roughly right there. So we know that's the center of the gas line in the basement. That's actually the only thing protruding going in there. So we've got the option to basically come out in the center of uh, this board, this one, or this one, or this one. So basically we have four options here. So if we go over to the center of this board, if we go that way on the gas line, Looks like about one foot over that we can mark down in the basement. We'll know where that is. And then on this one, five inches, 19 inches, and 37. So now let's go down in the basement and see what is up in there. At again, uh, 12 inches, five, 19, and 37. But then we also can't drill through the LVL and this transition line right here on the inside of the basement should be the top of the LVL and the top of the subfloor. So we need to go down 14 inches from there, which means these two intakes and exhausts are basically gonna be down here around your feet. Uh, I guess technically I could put one under the deck that's kind of protected by like dust and wind and rain and stuff, but uh, I don't know, I gotta think about that where we actually wanna pop out. It, do you think it's okay that we'll have the intake and exhaust basically all the way down here by your feet? And like this would be the exhaust and not that far away would be the intake or do we wanna have the exhaust all the way up here as high as it can go? And then again, put the intake all the way down there uh, underneath of the deck where you can't see it. That way you're not sucking your exhaust like right back in. So below 14 inches, and if we don't want to hit any uh, upper rebar, we would basically have to punch through the center of this block. That way we know we'll miss the horizontal rebars on this block here. And we just have to get lucky that we don't hit a, uh, a vertical one. But again, let's go down in the basement and let's see what we're actually messing with. God damn it! <laughs> Scared. Well, crap, we already have a problem, I'm sure that you can see. So, going that way is not going to work. Five inches over is right there, so that means we would have to put a hole somewhere up, like right in here, which that actually technically could work. But it looks like we might have to do the intake and exhaust actually below the deck on both. Because obviously, you got the top of the LVL all the way up there, and we said probably somewhere right about there would be up on the deck. Now, if we measure the deck for how thick those joists are, those are two by tens, I think. So we'd be somewhere down around here and we would actually be under the deck. And we obviously have to go this way. And if we wanna core drill this thing today, uh, I don't have the LP smart siding going that way, but we do have that one option right there at 12 foot over. So it looks like we could put this guy maybe up there, like I said, and then this guy could go under the deck, like maybe down in here. And then again, that way they would be separated, but the upper one would have to be the exhaust, the lower one would have to be the intake. So that way, I guess the hot air or the exhaust basically can go up and rise. Crap, that sucks though, that we can't go that way because uh, of all those wires and everything that are in the way. All right, well, like I said, at least I have a game plan. I'm gonna think about this a little bit more. Uh, we're gonna go get the tool and then we'll start making our cuts. Oh my gosh, I'm scared. 
Okay, so again, 12 inches over center of this, we know we're good. This is the exhaust, by the way, so we know that we can keep the exhaust high and we can put the intake lower and under the deck. So 12 inches over, we know that we'll drill right here through the center. And then if this is the LVL and the subfloor to here, 14 inches goes all the way down here. And I figured from there, nine inches would be okay, that nothing would really be around anything. So if that's the center of the hole, three inches is gonna go all the way down there. I've got a little bit of leeway, so I'm probably gonna drill a hole somewhere around seven, eight. So if we want a proper hole down in here, crap, we're gonna have to be somewhere between 19, and if we wanna miss more rebar, that's almost freaking chest high or lower for the intake then. Well, if this doesn't go to show you to make sure you put all of your penetrations through your ICF wall before you actually pour. I can't make, I can't stress that enough. That would have been a hell of a lot easier just to put some uh, six inch or more PVC pipe going out through there. And uh, another two that again, I forgot when we put in the, uh, the water lines, we forgot those. And then one last one I forgot over here in the septic because we have a mound system we have to run electricity into the pumper station that's going to pump our sewage uphill and up here to a mound system in the front yard and uh, i don't have an electricity going through the icf wall over there so that's three spots that i forgot five if you want to include or even six if you want to include all the water lines that we have to put out for outside spigots all right everybody here we go if you're noticing something different that i said i wasn't going to do uh, we did go ahead and get the hammer drill and we got a half inch bit so we can punch some pilot holes and we know what we're doing. While I was there, I also got this massive like inch and a quarter bit because that is what is going to be needed to go ahead and punch through so we get all of our water lines in. But while I was there, he swore this particular bit for an actual core drill does not need water. And he also says this one in particular will cut through rebar. So I figure this is just gonna be a thousand times quicker of a process to get a different type of drill and uh, it should work. He swears it will not break my arm because this thing has a clutch in it, no different than like this has a clutch in it. So if you turn this guy all the way down to like two as it's spinning, if it catches, I can close this thing with my hand. See? and it's not breaking my hand. So if this thing catches, the clutch in here will slip and I don't have to worry about this thing uh, twisting and jacking my hand. But if you turn this guy all the way up to drill power and turn this on, you, you cannot stop this thing. If it catches, it'll rip the entire drill out of your hand. So he swears that that thing will work basically the same way. And again, I won't be charged because this thing can cut through concrete rebar and I don't have to use water. He just said it would probably take longer. So let's go drill a pilot hole. Let's make sure that we're in a good spot. Then we'll cut out the foam and we'll cut out the LP smart siding. And then hopefully this guy will just insert into that area and the foam and the LP will actually hold it up that I can just drill straight in. And hopefully all of these bits can cut through wood. I know that sounds weird, but that doesn't look like a great bit to actually go through wood easily. It's obviously made just for concrete. But if we can get the pilot hole in the inside, no big deal. I'll get a uh, actual drill bit for like this guy and we'll cut out the wood on the inside of the house. I love it. So freaking easy. Using this as a hammer drill, that would have taken 10 minutes. That took what, uh, 15, 16 seconds? I am bottomed out, but I don't think I'm all the way through on the inside yet. Let me go turn the light on. I think we might have to cut a little bit of this LP out so that we can go all the way down to bottoming out on this guy here or get a bigger drill bit to cut this out so like we can go in more. 
Hopefully that one inch bit or bigger, like inch and a quarter bit, will go through that concrete just as easy. Now I say we punch through. What do you think? A little bigger than I thought it was gonna do. That destroyed that particle board, but not a problem because now I can come in on the inside of the house and use the uh, six inch hole saw to cut out all that so it still looks pretty. So those bits will go through wood, but they make an awfully big mess when they do it. Or again, it's just that particle board being so weak, it kind of just explodes. All right, because this hole's bigger, I am gonna have to make a new hole with this drill bit because it's just gonna walk in here. But all of this is basically just gonna be taken out, so it's not a big deal just to move it up just a hair. And that's what I mean by catching. Wish me luck. Let's get a mask, shall we? Wow, that was tough, but I made the mistake. As you see, I corrected there in the end. The bit kept getting stuck because once you're halfway in, the dust doesn't blast back out and the dust is filling the void, getting everything stuck. And then I can't pull the drill bit back out. So you kind of have to go in and then pull out and the dust will shoot out with it as you saw. So in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. And then that last inch or so actually was a hell of a lot easier. I'm so tired though trying to get that thing to pull out of a stuck space. But the uh, inside of the particle board has not been cut yet. I guess I can put that back in and try. I'm just afraid it's gonna not cut cleanly through the particle board and it's gonna blast out and then it's gonna look real nasty all along the edges, but it doesn't really matter. This thing's gonna get foam filled. Uh, once we put the uh, metal duct in there, we'll foam fill it around there and it will hold it tight. And then on the inside, you probably won't see the particle board because uh, the insulation around the duct is so big. I guess I'll try to cut through the particle board right now. 
I'm gonna wash this and get it all cleaned up. That way, when I silicone the uh, the ductwork in and the uh, the vent, that uh, that again is going to be the exhaust. So we've got a flapper valve. We'll still put a bug screen on it. Then we'll slide that in, screw it down, and silicone it up. And then we'll get it painted when uh, we finish putting on the second coat of paint all along this LP here. But I need a break, and then we'll go underneath of the deck and do the same thing. But there you have it. We are one step closer to get this HRV up and running. All right, one and done. The only thing that that's gonna be a problem that I have to take care of basically every winter is the weather always comes from that direction and blows in. So when this deck piles up snow, I got a feeling at least maybe once, twice a year, we may get about a foot of snow and then it's gonna plug that up. So I'm gonna have to walk out here on the deck and basically just blow it off. Not to mention because that is the exhaust. We're going to be blowing like 70 degree heat outside. All that snow around there is probably going to melt, which means actually I might not have to clean it off, but we'll probably be forming some like icicles around there basically, but is what it is. Can't stop it. No matter where you put a vent on a house, uh, you're going to form condensation when it meets uh, the freezing cold air out here. But uh, that's one and done. We're going to paint it up so at least it blends into the house. I put silicone around the gasket because I do not trust that gasket. The screws that go all the way through, I silicone the screws on so water can't penetrate back behind the screws and get in there. And again, the paint will probably fill in some of the voids and stuff and make that thing 100% waterproof. All right guys, I'm about halfway through the lower one. I knew I was gonna hit rebar because I did not wanna go that low. I wanted to go as high as possible. And uh, I'm going right through where a piece of rebar is, where uh, two blocks come together. So I knew there was gonna be a horizontal, but I think I even got unlucky enough that it's two pieces of rebar that have whatever the recommended overlap was. I think it was like 30 inches or so of overlap. So it's literally two pieces of rebar horizontal side by side. I got through the first one and I'm, <laughs> I'm going through the second one, but holy crap, I noticed something that I was not expecting. This basement has been poured for almost three years now. And in the dead center of this concrete in there, I don't know if you can see the difference in color, but the reason why the center of that concrete is colored like that is because it's soaking wet. If I put my hand on it and rub it and pull it out, my hands are moist. And no, again, I'm not using uh, water. This concrete is so freaking protected from the elements being inside of the ICF that that concrete is still drying three years after the pour, which is kind of a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because that does officially mean ICF concrete is stronger than a typical house foundation concrete because when you pour a typical house You put up your panels pour the concrete and then you pull the panels off like a week or so later And that way the concrete starts drying out uh, From the outside in and out through the top and anywhere that air can get into Well because this is basically a hundred percent air sealed and insulated that concrete can't dry out so it takes longer for it to dry out, but the longer concrete dries out for, the harder it gets. So I guess that is true what they say. ICF house concrete, even though you can use the exact same mix on a regular house, ICF is actually stronger because it will take longer to cure. And it's basically over the time frame that it's been curing, it's more consistent because you don't give that shock wave uh, once those panels are removed and that thermal reaction is happening. Every time it's, you know, hot in the day and cold at night and the concrete's going up and down, up and down, that's probably why you see concrete crack in regular foundations sometimes. 
uh, but an ICF, I just don't see that happening because of how thermally controlled you are controlling that uh, thermal reaction as that concrete goes through its hardening process. So that's insane. Three years later, the center of that is still completely moist and uh, damn near wet. All right, guys, got it all done. I did have to put a piece of LP over here because obviously this wasn't going to screw to anything. So I had to screw it down to the straps and then the screws for this guy can screw into the lumber. But uh, the fiber valve is removed. You can probably look up in there and see right into the basement. And again, we do have a screen down in there. So whatever this sucks in from down here, hopefully it's not too dusty. I'll sweep up all this concrete dust so we're not sucking it in there, but I don't think it's a very powerful suction like a vacuum cleaner would be. And then I just did my first hole over here for the water line. Since I am going through the LVL this time and uh, not through particle board, that drill bit's not long enough. I'm like a half inch shy. So put a hole through right there. I'll get all that cleaned up. That way we'll have a water line on this side of the house. I'm gonna put one over here on the front. And again, I'll probably just get like a real small long drill bit to go through that LVL. And then I'll use like a two inch hole saw on the inside and cut that out. But I think Aaron's gonna want one over here. So we'll have one on the front, one on the side. And even though I didn't purchase one, I think I'm gonna, while I have the rental tool, I think I am gonna put one back on the back lower deck, uh, probably around where the uh, exhaust is maybe up a little bit taller just depends uh, on the inside of the basement what i have to work with but that way we'll have one through the garage so she can water anything through there if we need to we can wash the back deck or do anything back here we've got a side one now and now we'll have a front one and i think that is code that you have to have a water line basically on the outside of all of your uh, uh spots but i don't think the garage counts but i'm gonna get to just drilling uh two more holes real quick I am under four hours, so I just want to hurry up uh, and then I can return these tools under the four hour mark and I think I actually save a little bit of money, so. All right guys, we got it done under the four hours. So I was able to get like $64 back, but still grand total on that was something like $190 for just like three hours of renting something. I swear to God, this is the shit that pisses me off so much. This is what I think makes people snap. Not only do we get fucked every which way from Sunday, working and getting taxed on our dollars and then getting taxed on our taxes and property taxes and vehicle taxes and you die and you have real estate taxes and again you're just taxed 15 freaking ways from sunday all in the same damn dollar and then on the rental thing i noticed they charged me a fucking environmental hazmat fee on concrete dust that i'm cleaning up and that the sweeper pretty much picked it all up, but I have to pay a hazmat fee for? God, this shit pisses me off so much. All right, everybody, back inside. Here's where we stand. I got the exhaust all done. So where the metal pipe is coming through the wall, as you can see, I spray foamed it to hold the pipe in place. So that's kind of air sealed, hopefully, from there to there. Then I stretched the pink insulation and this uh, silver stuff over top of that foam. And then I spray foamed it in there again. So once the stuff hardens, it hardens really, really hard. So hopefully over time, this thing doesn't move a lot and like break that seal. But uh, that is pretty rock solid. As you can see here, because we had to go lower below the deck, this one doesn't fit. So two options here. I can buy more of this stuff, which is probably going to be really expensive because I need, I think they come in like 25 foot sections and I literally need like a foot and a half. Or I can just take some regular pink uh, house insulation and like wrap it a little bit of it at a time and then take the tape and wrap it around there so the tape holds the fiberglass not tightly but it holds it against there and then we'll just bring the tape all the way up to here until we meet the meet the silver again but this pipe right here goes all the way up into here so there's not a lot of like horrible bends for that intake, but I think that's gonna work out really well. But I gotta go get more tape anyway, and we have to go to the store and get the uh, the tubing for the condensation drain. So 
I'm gonna go to Home Depot real quick. I will get this and get in, into the little giant. And then I just need to make this last connection right here uh, by putting in a T and that way we'll go in there and then we'll be 100% done and we can fire this thing up tonight. So I'll be right back after getting some supplies and then we'll get this thing done. All right, before we get back to the HRV, I at least want to get one of these done because it looks like it's going to storm. So I want to close these up. I was able to find this bit at Home Depot. Uh, it should be long enough that right there we're bottoming it out on the LVL. So we just have to punch through the other side and then we can take our whole saw bit and go in this way and be able to get out a two inch hole. And then hopefully this is long enough that it kind of sticks out either in that LVL or at least kind of in this hole area. And then that way I can just expand some PEX A pipe, throw it on in there till it bottoms out obviously on the brass and then it'll close up on here. And then that guy will be locked tight. And we'll have this all siliconed and screwed in out here that we should be good to go. Well, she's a little off, probably because I went up at an angle with the drill bits like going up this way through that concrete. And then that guy right there, I went straight into the LVL. I probably should have come up and went down like that, but uh, I guess fingers crossed, let's go install it on the outside or at least push it into the hole. Hopefully it goes all the way through. And as long as I can see the end of that brass uh, connector, we know that we can put the, uh, the PEX A piping right on it and we should be good to go. All right, so here's the cover. Like I said, it's got a natural five degree slope. So when the water is turned off and the shut off valve happens back in here, all the water in here will run out on to the uh, side of the house and we'll get all the water out of here so you don't have to worry about anything freezing. But let's just hope we did this right. Sweet. What do you guys think? Barely even know it's there. All right, last thing before we get this thing set up and running, they want us to put a uh, condensation drain on here and they want to set it up like a, uh, uh, a P-trap. So you got two hoses that will go on here with a T in the middle. The T will face upward. And then this upward hose goes up and then back down. And again, it basically makes a P-trap. I think they only do that because they don't know where the condensation drain's going. I don't know if that really helps for increased uh, water flow, but if you're putting it down in like a sealed sump pump or something and you don't want the stink coming up into here, especially that little giant, if that thing gets moldy, etc., we don't want that to be sucked up in here and then smelling and blowing out moldiness all throughout the house. So probably a good idea that we do a P-trap. All right, everybody, we're ready to fire this thing up. I'll take care of that insulation later. It's sealed up there, so no air leaking will happen. But uh, condensation drain is done. The duct work is done. Let's go upstairs and let me show you how this thing works. All right, everybody, hopefully this works. I just turned on the breaker and we can see it now reads ventilation system. It did run for about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds and uh, then it shut off and I actually shut it back off. So I went through a quick tutorial here online. Uh, I do have some uh, notes here. I'll link a video down below so you guys can watch what I was watching. I don't know if this guy's an expert, but it's just basically just a quick rundown. And I'm gonna have to learn as this thing goes along uh, to see what's gonna be right for us. But obviously the first thing that we have here is the on off button. That's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Now, hopefully you can see all this. We obviously have our fan speed. We have our humidity, which seems to be about right because I've got a thermostat over here next to me and it's reading 58 with an okay smiley face. And downstairs in the basement right now, I can hear the uh, dehumidifier running and it's set to 55, so we're pretty close. Uh, I think that's probably too humid though. I think most houses in the summertime, it's gonna be kind of hard to fight that, uh, to get that under 55, 60, et cetera, because right now, for example, it's raining outside or it just rained for a minute. Um, so the humidity is gonna be extremely high. So to get that down, I think it's gonna be a little difficult, but uh, 
right there with the uh, humidity setting there, which we'll actually go ahead and turn off for now. We won't worry about that. We'll come back to it later. But uh, so on off button, fan speed. I can hear that guy running right now. So that's probably putting out its full 267 uh, CFM that it's running at at its max pace. And I can hear it where I'm standing right here, dang near all the way over there in the utility room. So it's not that loud, but we may have to do some silencing over there so I don't have to hear that thing run all the time. Now, real quick, the only other thing that this on off button does also, when a wrench appears, it tells you it's time to change the filters and you may have to do some uh, other maintenance on the unit. If you press and hold the on button for five seconds, it'll reset the wrench that shows up right there and it'll get rid of it. All right, so first button here, if we go ahead and turn that on, a 204060, that basically means that you're ventilating the house automatically. So if you just took a shower, you just cooked some dinner or something, you can just quickly hit 20, 40, or 60 and it'll run for that time and then it'll go back to your factory setting so you don't have to sit there and play with your factory settings you can just simply hit that one or two times or three times let it do its thing and then you don't have to worry about it it'll go back but uh that would be again for like cooking a stinky dinner and you want this thing to ventilate for an entire 60 minutes an entire 40 minutes or an entire 20 minutes it just all depends what you're going to need and if you need that all right, so the first setting here we have, we've got 1050. That basically means you're bringing in outside air for 10 minutes and you're exhausting the inside air for 10 minutes, and then it's gonna be on standby for 50 minutes. And what this guy says, this would be kind of like a, maybe a low occupancy in the house, maybe we're not home. Um, coming into like now, so like spring, summertime, if you got the windows open, Obviously the windows are gonna be bringing in air anyway. Uh, I would probably just shut that off, but uh, uh, if you shut the windows at night, and again, it's just me and Aaron in the house, or I'll probably actually leave it right here at 1050 because Aaron and I aren't living in the house. This would probably be a perfect setting for that, and uh, that's probably what we're gonna go ahead and use for now. So the next setting is the 2040, basically the exact same thing. It'll run for 20 minutes, and then it will be on standby for 40 minutes. And that also seems to be like a later fall time or spring time, early spring, when all your windows are closed. You just want some more fresh air coming into the house for a longer period of time. Then you can go ahead and do the 20 on and the 40 off. Next, we've got the 20 bringing in and then the 40 goes to a constant recirculation. So basically the uh, HRV will be running 24 seven in, uh, in that situation. Uh, this would be for if you needed to recirculate your heat or recirculate the air kind of in the winter and if you started getting like humidity on the inside of your windows. Uh, this would be that the temperature is dropping really fast in the winter time uh, and your house is staying warm. You can get condensation on the windows. This would probably be a good setting that we may have want to look into when last winter it was negative 40 wind chill and all of our windows started frosting up. We may have wanted to do this setting to kind of help bring that humidity down, but there is a better setting probably than that uh, to probably take care of that this winter if we do hit that negative 40 again. Next, continuous inside or uh, inside outside and it just runs inside outside. There is no on off or recirculating here into the house. And this would be the one I was talking about for the ice windows. This would be you drastically need to get the moisture down. And because outside in the wintertime when it's freezing cold, there's really no humidity in the air and it's really humid in the house or the house is a lot hotter than it is outside, you're just constantly bringing in that drier air and getting rid of everything into the house. And that may again have really helped our windows from frosting up when we hit that negative 40. But then again, negative 40, it just may never Ever happen because it's so unbelievably cold outside and it's so warm on the inside unless you got triple pane windows and you don't have a lot of windows to begin with I think that's gonna probably be hard uh, if anyone up in Alaska or Canada has got anything to say let me know but uh, again this setting here would drastically bring down um, the humidity quickly by again bringing in that winter dry air and getting rid of that inside uh, more humid hot air Oh, and he also said this would be a good setting maybe if you're having a party 
where maybe all the, it's not springtime or uh, fall, but uh, you wanna basically always have fresh air coming into the house. Uh, and that would make the house constantly smell good because you're bringing in that fresh air. So that would be kind of like a party setting also. All right, next up, it goes without saying, that's recirculating the inside air only. Uh, this setting seems to be when your AC is on and uh, all your windows are closed up and maybe you wanna bring that colder basement air or something, you wanna circulate it all throughout the house a hell of a lot better, um, but you're not gonna be bringing any fresh air in, so you really wouldn't wanna use that for a long period of time. Maybe if you just wanna move the air throughout the house for a little bit of time and uh, um, you wouldn't use it overnight, and again, you wouldn't use it for a long period of time. And that's about it for the setting. So like I said, we're probably, we're, we don't live in the house, I'm probably gonna do this 1050. We probably don't need the fan to go that fast because Aaron and I, again, aren't living in here. So we'll probably go with that. The only other thing on here, obviously, is the reset button. That resets the entire system back to factory settings and getting rid of everything that I just did there. Uh, let's go ahead and turn that off. And last is this humidity control. Uh, this is a one to two day type of thing you're not gonna change the humidity in the house in like an hour. Um, you would wanna go ahead and set this to say, right now we're at 58. Let's say we wanna bring it down to 50. But what I was kinda getting from his explanation is that the HRV seems to be more of a, uh, with the humidity at least, it seems to be more of a winter thing. Um, because this thing isn't really a true dehumidifier, I don't think if I set that to 50, I'm gonna come in here in like 12 to 24 hours and see the humidity actually drop to 50 in the summertime because it, again, it's so humid outside. There is a graph that I'm showing you right now to kind of show you where the uh, winter settings are for what you want your house's humidity to be at. But if you look all the way at that bottom of that graph, you will clearly see above 32 degrees it wants you to say around 40 max, but in the summertime when it's raining and the humidity is 100%, I just don't think you're gonna get down to what you're gonna get down to. That may be where an actual dehumidifier like in the basement kicks in because that's what it job is. It's simply just to pull humidity out of the air instead of this thing um, that's actually doing more air circulation than actually dehumidifying. But yeah, what do you guys think? It's not bad that it, again, it was spring, it was raining. Uh, it's very hot outside and muggy and the dehumidifier actually is turned off right now, so it hit its 55 in the basement. And up here, if I'm not breathing on this thing, uh, we can see that that one is 58 and that one's 56. So they're all really close on their humidity settings, so that's awesome. But uh, again, I think with Aaron and I not in the house, and again, looking at my cheat sheet, uh, not home, low people, uh, summertime if the windows are open and bringing in air. We don't have that going on, but Aaron and I are not in here. So I think 1050 is gonna be perfect. We'll just have to come back at a later time in the summer and play with this and actually see if I do set that to 50, will that thing actually work as a dehumidifier or somewhat of a dehumidifier along with the dehumidifier in the basement and will they work together? And if I can actually set that guy down lower than 55, because at 50%, that thing basically just runs 24 seven and it's not a good thing. In fact, having that guy set at 50 about three or four weeks ago, because it was continuously running and there was a bad rainstorm one night the uh, sump pump kept kicking on, off, on, off, on, off. And because both of those were plugged into that single outlet, which is a home run outlet, there's nothing else on that, and it's a 20 amp circuit, the GFI or the breaker kicked off. I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the breaker, Aaron said. So that means we were overloading the breaker by having those two things basically run constantly. So we will maybe have to move that dehumidifier somewhere else but it will have to be when we're actually living in the house because when the bucket fills up, I can just uh, manually dump it out as opposed to right now, it just constantly drains down into the uh, uh, the sump pump. So, uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of scary uh, that, that that cut off because the water level was almost overflowing in the basement and that would have been a really bad thing for us to flood the basement. So 
I wanna keep that thing set at 55. But uh, again, when we're living in here and I'm in here constantly, we'll just fill the bucket up and put it on a designated outlet right here where it can run constantly. Or if we can get the house down to, you know, 45 or 50 or whatever we think is comfortable. But again, let me know if you guys think that if I did set this guy down to 50, would this thing work as a dehumidifier? And then that thing basically will work a lot less or work a lot or not as hard. And then I don't have to worry about that running continuously and kicking the sump pump off. But uh, let me know, anyone who's experienced, let me know what you guys think about that. But that's it guys. Uh, there is one other thing that I do have to do though. I still have to balance the system. Right now, the intakes and the exhaust are wide open throttle. I still have to buy that manometer, I think it's called, and I have to balance the system by adjusting the intakes and the exhaust and everything on the unit itself and kind of closing the flapper valves. But I got a feeling you're gonna have to do that again because once we put our grates in and stuff, the grates are gonna restrict airflow. So we'll have to balance the system again. Maybe I don't want uh, in the winter time, maybe right in the, the, the fresh air going down into the living room in the basement, maybe that's blasting too much cold air because again, you're sucking in you know negative or freezing temperatures and I don't want that like blowing on my face. So I would have to close the vent below my feet in the basement, which that again would then require me to balance the system. So I'll balance it once with everything basically wide open and then I'll just have to kind of balance it maybe a couple times a year or just depending on, again, what we put the, uh, the great settings actually to, like fully open or semi or, you know, damn near closed. But that's it guys, again, I think for now, I'm just gonna leave it wide open throttle on the unit and all of the duct work. I'm gonna leave it at that 1050. I'm gonna have to ask Erin if she thinks it smells better and uh, we'll play with, with the dehumidifier settings later. But uh, I think that's awesome. I'm glad you guys came along to watch it. So wrapping it up here, if you guys got anything to say, comment down below, hit us up on Neck of the Woods 2020 as always, if you got something to say, or you can see pictures where I get stuff done more sooner rather than later. And then Aaron takes a picture and gets it up there before I have a chance to get a video out. But I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope this one had a little bit more work in it so you guys don't just hear me talk. And uh, until next time, take care.